what I, I, I don't want to see Steve Trevor ever again. Hello, everyone. Welcome to This Is How It Starts. My name is Amy Stedland, and thank you again for taking the time to hit play. Now, I grew up in the period just before the boom of the home internet, so I'm part of a generation who knows a life that's very analog, and I also know a world where technology controls nearly all aspects of life. In this episode, you're about to hear what happens when two people who first met during those early days of the internet finally get to mix it up face-to-face -face in real time, so I'm excited to share this moment with you. Today, I'm speaking with Robert Jones Jr., the award-winning and New York Times best-selling author of The Prophets, a Black queer love story between two men in the antebellum American South, widely regarded as a new classic novel in the vein of famed authors James Baldwin and Toni Morrison. In 2008, Robert started his blog, Son of Baldwin, where he built a large social media following through his intersectional social commentary on race, sexuality, gender, disability, politics, and more. I've been a big follower of his thoughtful and sometimes controversial commentary for a long time. And now, my first ever conversation with Robert Jones Jr. Is that New York Times bestselling author Robert Jones Jr.? How are you? I'm doing well, Robert. Thank you. I'm so, so happy you're here today. Now, full disclosure, this is our first time ever speaking in real time. So I'm really excited and maybe a little nervous to have a completely fresh conversation with you. And this may or may not be part of an elaborate ruse to just hear more of your beautiful voice. <laughs> Amy, my sister in the Jan fam, thank you so much for having me. Yes, yes, that's how we connected was through our love of Janet Jackson. And just for the home listener, we just happen to be wearing matching shirts today. <laughs> We're both wearing our uh, velvet rope Janet Jackson shirt. So we are definitely on the same wavelength today. We met digitally in the old, early internet stages of like Janet Zone and, and those like message boards for Janet fans where you used to post your art. Okay, so we're like early web 2.0 here. Yes, it, so it, it's, been, it's been like since the 90s, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I could not remember if it was actually that far back or if it was more like the social media days, because certainly as you created Son of Baldwin, I remember being far more aware of your activity. So yeah, just racking my brain, trying to figure out when did it all start for us? Right, it's so hard to remember because I didn't have that Son of Baldwin persona when we knew each other. I can't even remember what my screen names were back in those days. Um, but def I definitely know that we met on one of the early Janet message boards. That's amazing. Yeah, you know, so many other friends that I've been connected to through Janet have been friends for decades now. And I'm just so, so grateful for that whole experience and that we came up in that time, sort of a magical time. Yes, yes that, that was quite a time. <laughs> so Robert, when I was thinking about doing this podcast, I had been thinking a lot about this whole economy of attention and this notion of uh, quote unquote, influencers who've never really done anything of influence and how being a miserable troll became a marketable persona and how other brilliant people just sort of toil in obscurity or even worse, they are received with disdain or even scorn. Um, and I, for one, I'm just so glad that you're one of those brilliant minds who is having a bit of a breakthrough with the release of your book, The Prophets, a New York Times bestseller. And I also think you're just a wonderful example of someone who shines a light on other amazing artists and writers. Now, I'm not very knowledgeable in the literary space, so I have truly been a beneficiary of all your knowledge and recommendations and the commentary you've shared over the years. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank you. Um, you're so right about um, what could have been a really um, important in a good way space is really becoming something that I call the digital Roman Colosseum, mm. um, where it's fashionable to be harmful to other people. And I'm, you know, let me implicate myself first. When I first started Son of Baldwin, I wasn't always um, looking for the better in other people. I was one of those people that got joy from um, tearing other people down and putting myself on a pedestal and, put my, and, and attributing um, myself to the moral high ground. Um, but quickly learned, or maybe not so quickly learned, um, how awful that actually was making me feel and how bad, and, and what an awful example of humanity I was displaying. 
And James Baldwin helped me a great deal in this way to realize that the things I do to other people, I'm really doing to myself. And so once all of that started to come home for me and, and make sense to me and really strike at my spirit, I said, I want to move in a different kind of way. I, I want to move in a way that lifts people up. Even as I critique these systems of oppression, I still don't want to be dragged down into the mire of um, targeting people, using my voice as a um, way to harm. I, I, I only want to be of, of service. Absolutely. Yeah, I've certainly had some moments I'm not so proud of. Um, a, a very similar awareness came up for me. Uh, I too was sort of having these reactions to things that frustrated me or where I just felt justified in my righteous indignation, but, you know, trying to be more mindful and try to find a better way, trying to be the change, you know? Yes, yes. Yeah, it takes a lot of courage to implicate yourself and acknowledge how you may have unintentionally played a role. That's not easy to do. So I commend you for that awareness and I, and I really respect you for that. And I, I hope to, to model that as well. So shifting back to your brilliance for just a moment, congratulations again on the success of your debut novel, The Prophets. Um, as I previously mentioned, it's an award-winning New York Times best-selling book. So what has life been like since the release of the book? It, it has been quite surreal. Um, I, I never knew what it would be like to have a lifelong wish come true. Mm. Um, I have always wanted to be a published writer, even if I didn't allow myself to admit it, if I, I didn't keep it primary in my spirit. Um, it is the thing that I'm here for, um, writing. And I always wanted to be a published writer. And then I got published in the midst of a pandemic, mm. the day before the storming of the Capitol. Okay. Um, and those things sort of stole my moment. Like, um, or at least they transformed it. And so I received it in a way that I was not expecting. Right. Um, and I have, um, so I, I feel like I'm in a bit of a limbo almost mm -hmm. like, like I, I am a published author and I'm not a published author. That's, that's what it feels like. It still feels like all of the like accolades and things are happening to this guy named Robert Jones Jr. And I'm watching. That's, that's kind of what it feels like. And I wonder if that stems from uh, my, my own insecurities about my craft, um, imposter syndrome, um, all, all sorts of things like that. If that's my way of um, pre-protecting pre myself against um, any negativity that might come my way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, so it's, it's been unreal in, in so many ways. Um, but I am, at the end of the day, thankful that um, I was able to finish this book, um, get it published, um, and that it's out in the world and that some people are finding value in it. That I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of them. My wife's one of them. And I, I can tell from the reaction that there's a whole lot of people that are finding value in it. So I'm so happy for you in that regard. I'm so glad that it's, it's done. Has this been something that's been germinating since like the 90s or? The first inkling I got for the idea of this story was probably like my last semester of undergrad in like 2006. Okay. Um, and it was my first semester of grad school where I first put pen to paper and said I could do this because I was afraid to write this story because I had never read a story like it before. Mm -hmm. um, and I was afraid of how it might be received by people that it might um, offend, um, which I think it has, um, and um, that it might place me in danger in certain ways, which it has not as far as I know. Um, but um, yeah, it from start to finish, from the time that I put pen to paper to the time I turned in my last revisions was 14 years. 14 years, wow, that is amazing labor of love <laughs> and a lot of tears and sweat and a bunch of other things i'm and sure late nights and and yeah. so on yes wow. indeed was, was that the first the first story for you that really crystallized in that way or had you written other things you know besides sort of like your social commentary were there other things that you had played with concepts that you had played with or when i was 16 i tried to write a novel um called conjure um 
And I never finished it because um, novel writing is difficult. Um, and it was particularly difficult as, at, at the age of 16. Um, and so I couldn't, um, I had a good chunk, but I, I, could, I didn't know how to wrap it up. I didn't know how to make it work. Um, so I put it aside. But that was the only other time that I attempted um, a, a big project like a novel outside of the profits. Got it, got it. Do you feel like that now with all of this 14 years of extra wisdom and knowledge, that might be something you go back to? Or is that something that was just kind of like, okay, I did that. I maybe just kind of had to work that out of my system. Whatever comes next is going to be fresh, you think? Yeah, because I, I think um, I'm currently working on another novel. Wow. Um, and I don't think I would ever go back to Conjure because it was a 16-year-old writing that with 16 year old craft and ideas and thoughts that are that are so childlike when I when I look at it I laugh at some of the things that I wrote um some some of the other things I go oh here's a colonel right here you know that, that he would be a budding writer or whatever but most of it is um not usable um and I like the idea that I could look back at that as like a marker of my progress completely understood yeah sometimes when I look back on some of my early you know the, the fan art it's a little embarrassing like sometimes I want to take it down but it's like you know what it, it's a it's a story it's a it's no. a whole thing it so, is, it is yeah. part of it is part of the story if I'm not mistaken I think how we met was through friends of Janet okay I think that's what it was okay um, and pals that happened too. A bunch of people that I'm we still might, in touch with. We might have been pen pals. I, 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 I'm not 100 percent sure, but we might have been. Um, <laughs> didn't you design their logo? I did. Like in some of the later issues of the magazine, I actually designed and illustrated for the magazine, the fan, the fanzine. Yeah, I remember. So, I remember. Yeah, I had little so, cartoons. So, so I've known you at least since then. So that's like 96, 97, something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> It's incredible. My goodness. <laughs> it blows my mind sometimes, for real. Yes, <laughs> it is. Speaking of that earlier artwork, I'm reminded of a topic that I wanted to discuss with you because I, I really respect your opinion. It's something that you've referenced um, a number of times in regards to comic book art, and that is uh, artwork drawn through the white gaze. Now, as a white artist myself, so many of my own personal projects revolve around the likenesses of Black musical artists and cultural figures. And I try to be thoughtful of my own blind spots in this area. And, and I'm, I'm not looking for any absolution here. If I need to sit on the hot seat, so be it. But I've been curious to hear more about what it is that you see or experience uh, when you encounter this type of artwork. Um, for me, how I define the white gaze is any pressure to conform or, 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 or create or build your art such that it confirms or makes comfortable a white audience. Um, so for example, um, there are some pieces of art where you'll have a black character who behaves in ways that you can tell were crafted specifically for white comfort. Um, right. uh, or you'll have stories where you have these black people who can't solve their own problems and, and then in comes the white savior to, to save them, save the savages from themselves, that kind of thing. Got it. So yeah. um, whenever I see those things, I wince because I know them to feel, um, for me, inauthentic, mm -hmm. that um, the writer was either under, the writer or artist was either under pressure to do that or has so internalized the ways of the society that they don't even realize that they're doing it. Um, and like my mentors, uh, my spiritual mentors, uh, Tony Morrison and James Baldwin, when I'm crafting art, I'm always asking myself, does this need to, if, if I'm writing this without the white gaze in it, what things don't I need to explain? Whose points of view don't need to be heard? Um, you know, th those sorts of things. I, I am very clear, or I try to be very clear when I'm crafting um, that I'm not succumbing to that um, that urge, that, that indoctrination that I should um, translate for a white audience. Mm -hmm. Because the truth of the matter is me as a, a black queer person, when I'm um, consuming a piece of art created by a white artist, I'm not expecting them to translate for me. I, as an audience member, 
if I don't understand something, I do the research and find out. And so that expectation somehow escapes a white audience. White, on, white audiences are expected to be catered to in particular ways right. such that they don't have to do the work, which then goes back to how I feel about, you know, um, the idea of how blackness is seen in this country as always in servitude. Where we're always, you know, we're the cleanup people, where we're, you know, there to make you feel better, mammy stereotypes, um, Uncle Tom stereotypes, all of that sorts, all of those sorts of things. Um, and so part of my job as a writer, which in itself is sort of reactionary, and I'm trying to find another way of doing this where I don't have to be concerned about those sorts of things. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that from your point of view of both a consumer and a creator. That's that's really insightful. Um, yes. When I think about the origin story of the Janet Jackson cartoon project that I'd been doing for about 25 years now, um, it stemmed from being a teenager and a huge Janet Jackson fan and noticing how, uh, if she's ever depicted at all, uh, when she is depicted through illustration or editorial, it, it's not very flattering or positive. Um, I feel like what I noticed was there was just like this visual shorthand of stereotypical racist features, these lazy markers that just like indicate, okay, that, that's a black person, but, you know, not ever really taking into account their unique facial features, their personalities, their talent, or their beauty. Now, I grew up watching reruns of the Jackson 5 cartoon, and I also remember when the Harlem Globetrotters guest starred on Scooby-Doo. So <laughs> you'll see a lot of that early stuff. My early work is modeled very much after that cutesy Hanna-Barbera, uh, Rankin-Bass type of character design. But that's where it started for me. You know, I was this huge fan, and, and it was upsetting to see those images because this is Janet Jackson in peak you know, peak 90s, she's one of the most iconic superstars in the world at the time, and she's still getting this sort of second class treatment. Um, and I think even post Super Bowl nonsense, I think it became even more important to me to make sure that people are aware of her artistry and her legacy in a positive way. So I guess going back and checking in with my own intentions, was I taking, you know, a white savior approach to this art where if, if I draw Janet in just the right way or where she's non-threatening or appeasing to white people, you know, to, to make them comfortable. But I, I'm hoping that even while I've played in some different illustration styles, you know, some that are cute and, you know, whatnot, but, but I'm hoping what I've actually achieved is just depicting Janet in the manner that she actually looks She's an objectively beautiful, talented Black woman, and she's a hero to a lot of people and just deserves to be depicted that way. Um, you brought up a point earlier about um, Janet's legacy and the way it's been disrespected. That is such a common theme in American history. Um, we go back to Ma Rainey or Bessie Smith um, or Sister Rosetta Tharp, all of these foundational Black women who um, in some cases invented whole genres of music um, who never got their respect um, until years, decades, centuries after they they're dead. Um, and it is of vital importance. And, you know, people sometimes hate the Jan fam because we can be so adamant about um, what Janet has accomplished. And every um, Janet Jackson Appreciation Day I post a thread of tweets of everything that I can think of that Janet, every record she broke, um, every accomplishment, um, I, I do a whole thread. So people remember, um, you're not gonna erase the blueprint. You're just not. Um, and though you attempt, um, you will know who this woman is and why she is vital. Um, what are you hoping for in this next era of Janet? We, we were supposed to get the Black Diamond era, but the, the pandemic sort of threw that out of whack. We're not quite sure what's happening now. Um, she, she teases these little pieces of things, but mm -hmm. we're not 100% sure if and when it's dropping. Yeah. Do you have any hopes? Uh, for me, with the unveiling of the whole Black Diamond concept, I was, I think I was hoping for Janet to finally claim her artistry and her legacy. Um, you know, I've always gotten the sense that Janet doesn't really like to draw more attention to herself. So she's She's very humble, you know, almost to a bit of a fault, you know, to the point where it's allowed people to forget or undermine like the full uh, oeuvre and the importance of her work and, and the influence that her contributions have made to modern entertainment. Yeah. Um, 
those contributions are monumental. And I think I was excited that maybe she was finally going to be like, yep, I'm that girl. I did that. To this day, um, I see her influence. Armani, uh, um, uh, so many others. Uh, going back some, Britney, um, Beyonce, Rihanna, like her, her influence is so... Um, ubiquitous it's like it's literally she's the blueprint for how you make an entertainer a superstar um you, you even see it in some of her her male influences and in some of the men who are who are entertaining too you know people tend to say well if it's a guy it's michael is the influence and if it's, if it's a woman then uh janet is the influence but no sometimes you see it in the guys too um even michael was influenced by her so <laughs> Yeah, when, when Bad came out, he was changed. He did the Pleasure Principle step in one of his videos. Yep. And I said, okay, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's what I was really kind of bracing myself for was this moment where Jana was really just going to own it. What about you? What were you uh, anticipating? Um, I was looking very forward to, um, because from what I understood, she was going to be working with a variety of producers. Mm -hmm. Um. So I was looking forward to hearing the sounds, um, uh, the new sounds she was, you know, going to work with. I was very much interested in what she had to say. Yeah. Um, this concept of Black Diamond and being resistant and resilient and um, still being in this industry after God knows how many decades. Wow. I was very interested in what she had to say. And I was also very interested in the evolution of her dancing mm -hmm. because I've watched her go from... Um, don't stand another chance all the way up <laughs> the shoulders honey <laughs> janet was killing them with the shoulders from the way shoulder. <laughs> back um to see her evolution because now you know she's older janet how old am i 51 so janet's going to be 56 in may she's five years older than me mm -hmm. um she, her dancing has changed she's become more graceful like and i just i love to see the fact that she, first of all, she could still do that if breakdown. That is just like remarkable. Better than um, the girls half her age, mind you. <laughs> better than the girls half her age. No shade to Ciara, but when she tributed Janet and she did if, mm, mm, it wasn't quite there, but great <laughs> A for effort. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Janet um, is one of those dancers who's precise. Like the, the, the hits got to, the, the moves have to be hit in a very precise manner. Um, and so uh, I'm very interested interested in seeing what it looks like for a 56 year old woman to dance with the level of skill that Janet has. Mm -hmm. um, I think of Tina, who, Tina Turner, who was um, boogieing and doing her thing well into what her 70s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I'm really I'm really interested in the trajectory of Janet's career as an older woman, as a mom, as yeah. you know all of these things. I'm really interested in seeing that, and I'm hoping that if Black Diamond is still a thing, mm -hmm. that we get to see some of, you know, that evolution. Yes, the evolution. Janet's been going for over 40 years. It's amazing. Now, going back to this notion of influence for a moment, you know, growing up, it was Janet Jackson and another one of our favorites, Wonder Woman, that were actually role models for me, especially Linda Carter's embodiment of Wonder Woman on Listen. the TV show. Um, I used to think of this notion of celebrity role models as kind of this kind of goofy, but if I'm truly honest about it, those two really had a real impact in shaping who I would become and the, the adult I wanted to be. And for a very long time, going back even to the, um, the, the Jackson family specials that used to come on, um, which is where I first encountered Janet. Um, she always exuded this sense of um, uh, autonomy that I found very striking. And um, Linda Carter on the, on, on the, on the same um, wavelength exuded this sort of unshakable grace. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a great way. And those two things together were super, I think were super influential in my life, yes. Yeah, I feel like it's those two notions of the the strength and vulnerability, which both of them have and just blend yes. so, so well. 
Now, if I start talking about Wonder Woman 84, I'll start to get a little fired up, but I was, <laughs> I was really excited to see Linda's cameo as Astoria. So maybe we'll get to see her again in a future movie. You know, the, the, the problem with the Wonder Woman films, um, there are moments in both of them that I really like. Agreed. But I think the overarching problem is this idea that we got to get men to watch this movie. So let's have Steve Trevor mansplaining everything to Wonder Woman. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, it's just like, yes. <laughs> what, I, I, I don't want to see Steve Trevor ever again. I want, I want a feminist film where Wonder Woman is at the center. She's not worried about some man and she's kicking bad guys' butts. That's, that's what I want to see. Absolutely. It was so simple. That's all we needed. I'm not sure how they messed that up, but hundred percent. Oh my God, you're preaching to the choir, Robert. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Like I said, and if I, I start talking about it, I'll start to get heated. So, <laughs> you know, and I, I recently returned to the first Wonder Woman film mm -hmm. and realized, you know, even my, my husband said the same thing. The best part of the best parts of these movies take place on Themyscira, Paradise Island, when there's no men, when the Amazons are working together and training and laughing and, and you know, joking and all that kind of stuff. In both of those films, those are the most exciting moments of the films. Yep. And in the first film, it's when Diana bucks Steve Trevor's advice and goes to cross no man's land yeah like that is such an exciting moment like you know and I wish I wish they would have had it so that she made it all the way across and Steve Trevor and them just we forget we forget all about them and she's the one that makes it across first and she you know disturbs things so right. that the troops can come over but they had Steve and the other men like go oh she's drawing all the fire let's sneak over here now and do this thing because right. you always the, the, the sense I get from the Wonder Woman films is it's always like, she's a strong woman, but not too strong, guys. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't have to be don't intimidated be by her. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're 100% in my brain all the way. I watched the first one um, up until the last 10 minutes. So for me in that first movie, Wonder Woman loses. I don't even watch the last 10 minutes. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't. I get, I get it. Okay, now that we've entered into Wonder Woman territory, one of the things you've recently turned me on to was the latest yeah. Wonder Woman series, <laughs> uh, the Historia series. Um, but I'm still waiting for volume two to arrive in the mail. Aside from a couple of Archie digests here and there, I never got into hero comics as a kid. Um, there was a brief time in the 90s during the image comic era, um, the Spawn era with uh, Todd McFarlane, Rob LaFeld and those guys. Um, and I think the reason that got my attention at the time was more so because I think it was the first time seeing the artists behind the books. I mean, those guys were like rock stars. They were on MTV and stuff. So I think that was interesting to me as a budding artist thinking about how I might, you know, find a career in the arts. So um, I hadn't really thought about comic books for a long time as an adult until I saw some of your posts. <laughs> Wonder Woman is the first comic book character I fell in love with. I, I was just, from the moment my father bought me a Wonder Woman comic book at the age of four, mm. I was super enamored by it. And I, I think that's how it worked. My, my father bought me this comic. I read it a zillion times because I didn't know that you can get more comic books. Mm -hmm. um, and then I discovered the Super Friends and she was on that too. And that was all she wrote. Um, uh, cartoon? cartoons yeah, yeah okay. from, from the 70s and um I that was it I I became a comic nerd and so I have been collecting comic books for over 45 years but it's really because of Wonder Woman I'm really interested in what she represents from a feminist point of view from a humanist point of view um and I really bond with that character and the idea of her um and I'm so thankful to be alive now when Kelly Sue DeConnick is writing this current series, Wonder Woman Historia of the Amazons, which is like the, the deep feminist dive that I've always wanted to see um, surrounding Wonder Woman and the Amazons. Like this is like real heavy duty stuff. And um, the art is just outstanding. And um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have been collecting comics for all these years. They're part of the things that helped me to um, deal with the world we live in. Mm. And I'm so happy to be alive now when a talented writer like Kelly Sue DeConnick is writing such a wonderful take on the character that I love. 
That's wonderful. For you as a writer and for me as an artist, I think we have an appreciation from slightly different angles and I'm learning so much from your point of view as well. And it's getting me more excited about it because usually I'm very much a nonfiction reader. Uh, my wife and I just had a big anniversary late last year and we took your book with us on our road trip. My wife read it and she loved it. And I've been trying to get through it and uh, not to give the impression that I haven't enjoyed it because to the contrary, uh, as an artist, I've just found myself getting so distracted by the visuals that keep coming up in my head because your writing is just so very rich and has so much visual texture in it. So uh, <laughs> I'm still working on it. I'm about halfway through. Um, I would love to see you write one of these one day because I feel like teaming you up with an artist would be a wonderful combination. Uh, I, I feel like your sensibilities around storytelling and your compelling kind of uh, visual language is just so strong. So I, I just, as an aside, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you very much. I do try when I'm writing um, to imagine myself in the space. So I'm, I'm making note of details that I'm then transcribing when I imagine myself in that space. And I, you're the second artist who told me that the writing is very visual. Um, Phil Jimenez, right. um, talented, super talented writer. He also told me, you know, it, it's so cinematic. It's so it's visual, word, yeah. um, the, the ways in which you write. And so thank you yeah, for that. Absolutely. Again, it's great to hear your take as a, a writer. And not that you're not enjoying the visuals too. It's not like an either or, but I know for me, when I got Historia Volume 1, um, I was reading it out on the back patio and, and when I got to this one particular frame towards the end, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but I just flipped out. I literally ran in the house to show my wife like, oh my God, you've got to see this. I, I had just never seen anything like it. You have to tell me which panel that was. I need to know. <laughs> it was a very graphic <laughs> involving an arrow. Oh, okay. I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. I mean, everything leading up to it, but, but the moment that it, that you know, the moment occurs, again, very cinematic. It was not like reading a book. It was like watching a movie. It was, in, I mean, I just did not anticipate having that kind of experience reading a comic book. It was mind blowing. Phil made some really interesting, interesting choices on that page that you're talking about, about how we see the blood first and, you know, then we see what happens and then there's the spiral, Yes. you know, of the events as they occur. It's, it's, it's just so yeah. wild. And I love the fact that in that book, red signifies the violence. So whenever we see red, that's our cue, that something is amiss in terms of violence. Yes. <laughs> it's just so smart. It's gorgeous. The characters are just stunning. I, I've truly never seen anything like it. And it's really raised the bar for anything that comes after it, for sure. Really, it, re it really has raised the bar. It truly has. I love that photo of Janet. You have the vibe thing in the back. Yes. That, that is one of my favorite photos of Janet from the Velvet Rope era. It's so sexy and um, it's, she's, she's like a, a siren. I, I just really love that photo of her. For the listener, uh, behind me on my wall, there is a framed photo of Janet. It's taken by uh, Ellen Von Unworth from what would become the Velvet Rope album shoot. Um, Janet is in what looks to be like a latex cat suit and uh, with one of her famous piercings, uh, this is a nipple piercing through her nipple as well as the cat suit. Um, there's also a handwritten note from Janet and Renee, uh, her husband at the time. The Velvet Rope turns 25 this year. Can you believe it? So, so there's actually some history uh, of that photo for me. Um, I don't know. I've, I've talked about it a little bit. It took me years to kind of feel comfortable, but um, that was the image that Renee and Janet sent to me so that I might come up with a concept sketch for the Velvet Rope album cover. I was about 19 years old, living with the real cover for 25 years now. I, I just can't imagine it any other way. So I've always kind of been curious as to what they had imagined, you know, from the request, but they, they shipped it to me and just kind of said, do your magic. Uh, unfortunately, I was just too green to pull off the image I saw in my own head, you know, what kind of happens for me as an artist is that I will see the final product sort of projected out here in, in my field of vision and I, I try to replicate that. Uh, so I had the brilliant idea to <laughs> that this would be a great time to test out a whole new digital painting style that I had never really done before. And I just didn't have the skills to pull it off at the time. 
So I sent off the sketch. Uh, I got a very polite thank you. Never really heard about it again. So obviously they went in a, in a different direction and I just can't imagine it any other way. So yeah, that's my little brush with greatness. It's my little piece of velvet rope history. The cover is so iconic. Do you, have you ever met Janet? I have a couple times. Yeah, very briefly, a couple times. She, um, and I tell this story all the time whenever I talk, Jan talk about Janet. Mm -hmm. I'm astounded by how much she can remember about people. Um, yeah. I met her for the first time in 97 at the Virgin Megastore in Times Square for the release of The Velvet Rope. Right. Then I met her again years later um, for the release of her book. Got it. She said, Robert, right? And it blew my mind. I'm like, this woman had, had met me 10 years earlier. Right and remembered my name. Yeah, same thing happened to me. Yeah, I met Janet for the very first time. Uh, it was a Friends of Janet fan club contest. Uh, she flew 35 fans from all over the world to Santa Monica for literally dinner with Janet. And uh, we got to hang out with some of the dancers and hear songs from the Velvet Rope album before it was released. So yeah, my first time meeting her was back in the summer, just before the release of the Velvet Rope album. There would be a couple quick hellos in between, but then years later, um, I paid way too much for one of those meet and greets in Las <laughs> Vegas during the Metamorphosis tour. Um, I just felt like this was probably gonna be my last chance to really thank Janet for seeing something in my work and supporting me in those early days. Um, you know, it's kind of goofy as it was. <laughs> now, walking up to her, I don't think she recognized me, but when I mentioned the cartoons and thanked her, uh, she kind of paused and took a step back and then she looked me square in my eye um, like there was this moment of realization and then she full out said my first and last name you know as if to confirm and, and I was just floored she looked, she looked at you right in your eyes that that I I sometimes I'm, I'm taken aback by that because you know she she her the, the public perception of her is that she's so quiet and shy um, but when she talks to you, she looks you dead in the eyes. Yeah, it's truly a moment that you will never forget. Um, but at the same time, I, I try to be aware of like energy, right? Like Janet is just one person and we all feel like we know her because she's been with us our entire lives, but she doesn't necessarily know any of us. There's so many of us that love her. She doesn't, she doesn't really know us. Um, so when you're coming at somebody, you know, and you have so much love for that person, right. but at the same time, it can be a lot to receive. So I remember I wanted to be very mindful about how I yeah. would express this to her, just trying to be very quiet about it. And then when she looked at me and said that, I got that huge lump in my throat, like I was gonna cry and I, <laughs> I nearly lost it. It was hard to recover from being seen that way, you know, by someone you really admire and respect so much, like, wow. She remembers. And I, I agree with that, that, you know, you have to be very mindful when um, interacting with someone like Janet because um, everyone's demanding something from her, um, you know? And so you have to be like, thank you for, I'm grateful you gave me this moment. Love you, bye. Um, just so that it's, you know, bite-sized so she could, you know, actually maybe receive it, you know? So yeah, <laughs> after that, I completely lost my train of thought and had that deer in the headlights moment. And then before I knew it, security was like, okay, thanks, next. <laughs> So yeah, you get a very short amount of time and you never really get to express all that she means to you, but I, I hope she knows how much she is loved and appreciated by all of us, you know, even if we can't always have those one-to-one -one moments with her. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. I cherish um, that those meetings, I do. Um, and, and they're enough for me, you know, like I don't, if I never meet her again, that's fine. Um, it's enough that she gave me those two moments. Robert, what else is coming up for you? Um, I know you mentioned you're in the early stages of your next book, but are there any upcoming events where people might be able to get to see you in person? Um, I will be in Pittsburgh in June um, for an event. I will be in France in September for the Festival American. Um, and I think that's really all that I have planned because what I'm hoping to do as uh, 2022 winds down is sort of fill myself off so that I could work completely on this novel. Like I want to commit 
my full creative energy to this novel and not have to worry about this or that or these other things. Um, so hopefully that, and somewhere in the future, um, after the second novel is done, I'd like to write a comic book. I would love to see that as well. <laughs> I, I would I would love to write a comic book. I have some ideas. Um, we'll see if that comes to pass. I will a thousand percent be rooting for that. I think that would just be amazing. <laughs> Well, I'm hoping maybe we'll get to have our Black Diamond moment. Maybe we'll end up in the same town uh, at the same show. And where do you where do you live, Amy? I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area these it's days. The Bay Area. Okay. I actually grew up in Detroit, but I've been in the Bay Area now for almost 20 years. I did not know that you grew up in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. wow! Okay. <laughs> I did not know. I've never I've never been to Detroit. I've never been to the Bay Area. Um, two places that I'm actually interested in going. I want to yeah. see Detroit and. I have friends in the Bay Area who have been begging me for years to come visit, so. Nice. I went out to New York for the uh, All For You tour. That was the first and only time I ever went. <laughs> wow, wow. Where did I see All For You? Oh, I saw it in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's where mm -hmm. I was living at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it, got it. Yeah, so you're, you're in New York. I am in Brooklyn, New York. Bed-Stuy, do or die. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well, Robert, one day, I hope we get to have that magical moment in person. Maybe I get to hug you. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. been a real, a real treat to have you have this time with you today. And I'm so grateful that uh, you were able to carve out some time. I am um, quite thankful, Amy, that you even wanted to talk to me. Um, this has been a long time coming. Our meeting has been a long time coming. We've known each other for such a long time. Um, this feels so natural. Um, so like you, I can't wait till we meet face-to-face -face in person. Absolutely. <laughs> Robert, much love to you. I'm sure we'll be nerding out over Historia Volume 2 any moment now. <laughs> Please, because I'm looking for a discussion partner. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Robert, thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. And that's my first ever conversation with Robert Jones Jr. I highly recommend Robert's award-winning novel, The Prophets. So visit sonofbaldwin.com to see how you can support independent Black-owned booksellers when you purchase your own copy, now in paperback. Robert and I actually recorded this discussion a few months back, so as of the date of this podcast release, Robert has retired his Son of Baldwin social media platforms to focus on his health and his writing, but he still is active with his website and uh, periodic updates, so make sure you sign up for his newsletter at sonofbaldwin.com. That's sonofbaldwin.com, S-O-N-O-F-B-A-L-D-W-I-N.com. As always, you can find my website at amybruckner.com. That's A-I-M-E-E-B-R-U-C-K-N-E-R.com. If you enjoyed that conversation, I hope you'll take a moment to rate, review, share, and subscribe so you don't miss out on the next episode of this limited series. Hope to see you again next time on This Is How It Starts with Amy Stevlin.